You've reached Monster 911, and I'm Lance Hightower. I've been taking cryptid emergency calls for over five years. If you have a cryptid emergency, please call our toll-free number, 866-306-8085. I can help you. What's your emergency? Hi guys, how's it going? This is Lance with Monster 911. It's good to be with you again. I hope everybody's doing well out there. Lots of things going on. Uh, this is the time of year they're starting to be more sightings. We've had some rain weather here. Of course, we're getting into spring. And one of the two times of year, typically, that you have a lot of creature sightings, spring and fall. And when is the best time, if you're an investigator or researcher, when's the best time really to look for prints and things like that? It's after a rain because everything is still soggy. The soil is still moist, which is perfect for a print. Um, now, there's certain terrains and topographies where it's just kind of impossible, of course. But in certain places where there's soil and wet uh, sandy bars and things like that down on riverbanks, remote areas, that's a perfect place. So don't forget, don't forget your pack, your, um, uh, your plaster, and any type of casting materials. Be sure to always bring that. Always bring that. And of course, when you take a cast, uh, make sure and note the, uh, put a GPS on it. Take note of that too. Take lots of pictures. Always measure your prints. Some people will put their hand down, but your hand, there's, we don't know. Everybody's hands are different sizes, right? Or they'll lay a dollar bill. Not everybody knows the length of a dollar bill, but it's some level of reference. So remember to either you can get what's called a uh, cloth measure or a tape measure that they measure cloth material or clothing material with, like a seamstress, you can use that. It's light, it packs easy, you can roll it up. That is something you can always keep in your pack with you. It doesn't take a lot of space and they're very, very inexpensive. That's what I use sometimes, uh, but that's just the cloth measuring tape or seamstress uh, measuring tape. It just coils up. So be sure and always take that when you're measuring prints. Uh, and by the way, they're, they're, it is water proof or water resistant. Um, that's a good way to get a reference point. And when you're doing prints, um, to get the three dimensional aspect, some people will just, you know, take a picture from down, take it, look straight down. Um, but don't forget also to get an angle so we can get the depth. So sometimes what I like to do is yes, I'll get, I'll back away and, take a look and sometimes um, I do this sometimes you know those flags that you can get that are um, oh like linemen will do we call it Oki 911 here or excuse what is it Oki I can't remember it's something like that Oki 311 or something like that um, 611 uh, anyway uh, it's just basically the utility company will come out and they'll flag all your uh, gas lines, water lines, and uh, coax cable lines for your uh, internet. And so they'll put flags. And so I've always saved those flags. So I'll pack those. They're very light. They're easy. And so when you see prints like that, I'll go off to the side and flag them and flag them. Then I back away and get more of a bigger perspective of these prints, where they're at, the distance. Um, also, when you're taking an up-close picture of a print, where I was going with this, is that we want to see kind of the three-dimensional aspect of a print, especially if it's a good clear print. So always bring a flashlight. Sometimes you can have someone hold a light or you can take a picture at an angle so you can get the depth of the print. All that is important. But if you're, you know, especially if you don't have any casting material, uh, that's when it's really important. If you've got casting material, you don't have to do so much because that's going to give the three-dimensional aspect anyway. But anyway, I'm just kind of giving a few hints there um, that I use, not that it's perfect, but, you know, I've taken enough of these pictures that I kind of look at uh, people send me lots of pictures. The biggest thing is that there's no reference of size. So you can put your foot by it and that's fine, but we got, how big is your foot? So inches, centimeters, whatever you choose to use there. Uh, but everybody knows what a dollar bill is, so that's not bad. Uh, some people put shotgun shells and things like that, but then again, you have uh, two and three quarter, three inch, you know, what size do you really have? So if you can bring a tape measure, those, those seamstress tape measures work great. Um, but in the meantime, for the show, um, let's see what else is going on before I talk about the show. Um, let's see. I'm feeling much better. 
Many of you know, um, I had an episode, really bad episode, the worst episode I've ever had, my low back. Uh, one of the reasons why I got into healthcare was because of my body, my beating my body up over the years. I received a lot of relief through chiropractic care and decided to become one. Um, so because of some of the work around the homestead and uh, eh, gaining a little bit of weight more than what I should uh, and not keeping my core strong, I had a very bad injury um, to the point where I couldn't sit in this chair. Um, so it, I, I didn't do a podcast for, oh my gosh, four weeks, uh, which I didn't care for because I like being with you guys. But anyway, I'm much, much better. I'm 98% better. I still feel it, but it'll take probably a good year to heal. But otherwise, I'm driving, um, walking around the property, no problem. Um, I was to the point where I had to have a cane. That's how bad it was, which uh, humbles you real fast because I'm, I'm a doer. I get, things, I get a lot of things done, and I couldn't get anything done. Uh, it was painful, but I'm back in the saddle again, if you will, and I'm excited to always be with you each and every week. Um, so... Keep those calls coming. Keep the comments coming, too. Um, I do try to review the comments absolutely when I can. I still work, uh, so I don't review the comments till late at night, and uh, sometimes my eyes cross because I'm so tired to go to bed early. Uh, but keep them coming, and if you can comment on someone else's comment, that would be great. I appreciate that. Many of you are still asking here and there about T-shirts. Um, we still have the Monster 911 shirt. That's a good way you can help support the uh, channel. You can go to monster911.com. You can We have a store there, and we have lots of different colors, a lot more sizes available now. Uh, we're also on Twitter, we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, and we're on TikTok. So uh, this next show, this next show um, is from a guest that contacted me a few years back. Very, very interesting and quite terrifying story regarding a dogman creature. Um, she's in a line of work that she, uh, let's just say, she uh, is an observer. Um, and she's not much afraid of anything either. Uh, but anyway, I thought it was very hair-raising. She um, still lives in Oklahoma. She called me back uh, a few weeks ago, and I was so happy to hear from her. I remembered her story just off the top of my head, and uh, she just couldn't, oh, yeah, you still remember? I said, oh, yeah, I still remember that story. So anyway, she called to follow up the friend that she was on the phone with that night two years ago. I think it was about two years ago when I did the interview with her. Well, they're going to come on. We're going to try to get them on, too. I haven't done that yet, but we're going to follow up this week with her. So this next show you're going to hear is her account some new things uh, based on some of the recent uh, channel, um, some of the shows that I've had. So should we talk about some new things? And then we rehash some of the previous interview I did a couple years ago. I don't think you guys will be disappointed at all. Uh, in the meantime, always take note, always be safe, and always Watch your six. So let's go there now to this guest that I had a few years ago and what we spoke about here recently. So the last time we talked, you had, um, was I right? Now this was off the top of my memory. I did not look at any books or anything. Was it the one where uh, you had something follow you? You did the running at night or am I thinking something different? Yes. Yeah. I, uh, I actually used to walk at night and, uh, I know you'll bleep it out, so I'll tell you anyway. It's when I lived in, and then we had moved, and you thought it had followed me. But now we live out. We finally were able to buy our own home. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. So this actually happened, and I, I uh, believe I said the time. I think it was like 6.30 at night on our way home. Yes. Okay. I thought you would think it was rather interesting, especially since this whole Biden thing. Um, and you can very really clearly see it's not a balloon. Mm, yeah, I saw that. It, it, did I see blinking when you sent that? Yes. Okay. It was kind of pixelated because I'm sure you had to compress it to send it to me. So mm -hmm. I was trying to look just in the center and I saw that blinking um, kind yep. of going on. So we have a couple different topics then to, to talk about this evening. 
Um, what do you want to chat first about? Well, I'd like to tell you more about that one that we saw on Saturday because it was my whole family, me, my husband, and my uh, my three daughters. Okay. Yeah, let's talk about that then. Um, well, as I said, it happened, I think... I, I put the date on the text. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it, I think it was like a week or two ago. And it was on our way home. Uh, we had just went and bought groceries. And I pointed it out to my husband. I said, what is that? And he goes, oh, it's a balloon. And I said, no, that's not a balloon. Because as you know, uh, from the house that we lived in previously, we lived right next to one of those large balloon uh, things that they do every year. It's a big festival of those large balloons. Oh, they're like hot air balloons? Uh-huh. Yeah. So I know what one of those looks like, and this almost looks like a rectangle in the sky. I mean, I tried to t take a singular picture of it before I took the actual video. Okay. And then in the video, you can see it blinking out. It's not just me not being able to control holding the camera because I have my hand steadied against the side of the truck. And it weirded my husband out enough. He wasn't going to stop. <laughs> he wanted to get home. <laughs> yeah. Um, he told me he didn't want to become a statistic. <laughs> well, you know, he's a smart man. Yeah, yeah, I agree with him. I actually truly agree with him on this one. When I first showed it to my best friend, he uh, he told me that he only believes in that kind of stuff if he sees it with his own eyes. And I said, well, wait a second. I recorded that. Listen to the recording. He didn't listen to it. He just kind of saw it on his phone. <laughs> Uh, After he listened to it, he said, oh, well, you know, maybe that did happen. Are you sure it wasn't a weather balloon? No, I, I know what those big balloons look like. This was not a balloon. Yeah, usually, yeah. It, well, because you had daylight and it was mm -hmm. still, was the sun setting? I was trying to recall the time of day. Yep. It was 630 in the afternoon. The sun was setting and this thing was brighter than the daylight sky. So I'm not a balloonist. Anyone that goes, I've never been um, in the baskets or anything like that. Now, I know they do night flying and I daytime, but mm -hmm. so I'm not mm -hmm. familiar if they are required by the FFA to uh, put up any lights or blinking or anything like that. Because usually the heat, when they throw that flame mm -hmm. to a sand, that usually is really bright. So I don't know. Exactly. Um, well, when those fly up in the sky, they literally look like you're holding a balloon in your hand, like up. Oh, yeah, you can right. You see the outline of the balloon. Even if it's one that has lights up inside the balloon, you can see the actual outline of the balloon. This thing looks rectangular. Hmm. And even weather balloons, they set them off from over there, too. The weather balloons are more square, but they're one, like, box-looking light. This is, you can tell this is a distance away. Uh, this is probably, we're probably three miles from it when I took the video. Oh. It just kind of caught my eye from, um, as we were driving by it. And we're going down a straight stretch of road as I'm recording it. And it kept blinking on and off. And weather balloons don't blink on and off. Those are one singular light that blink on and off. And right. the regular balloons, when they go up, they have lights a lot like a plane. Yeah. Uh, that way planes can distinguish them and know where they're at, and they have to know where they're at in the night sky when they're flying. And there's uh, two airports, so I have to pass by each one of those almost daily, so I know where they're at. Mm. And uh, um, this is not a, a flight path normally for any planes. Hmm. Yeah, that's and a good the, point. Planes aren't rectangular. That's what really got me. It. And when I asked my husband, he just told me it was something weird. I can get on my phone. I can record it. But he wouldn't tell very many people about it. And I'm like, there's one person I don't mind telling. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Well, I tell you, there's a lot more sightings of oddities in the sky in Oklahoma, among other states, too. But Oklahoma, especially in these rural areas, I have a buddy, uh, Wiley Dave, and he's had two close encounters with spacecraft. Now, when I say close encounters, one was so close, um, it was feet from his truck. The other, he had a different buddy, 
and he topped over a hill. This was just not too far outside of Tulsa in a kind of remote, the, the fields go forever. And he mm -hmm. topped over a hill at night and there was a spacecraft landed. He could see the landing gear and there was lights going around it. He, now he didn't see anything walking around or anything, but he could see the lights on the underbelly with the landing gear. And then he looked at this and maybe for another 10 to 15 seconds, the landing gear came up and then it took it, it, it uh, elevated off a little bit higher and then it just took out. Um, so the, his, the person that was with him was so scared. They were in the floorboard of the vehicle and had wet themselves. Oh my. They were that frightened. And, um, and Wiley was like, what's, you know, he's like, I am, let's get out and take a look. This is incredible. This is incredible. And he was that way with the first friend when he saw this craft go in front of the truck. He, it, it went across the field and then elevated up. It went across in, the, in front of them, went over into a field. The craft angled up and then it just took out. I mean, just blink of an eye, it was gone. And Wiley took his binoculars, got outside, went across the road and was looking at it. He said, did you see that? And the driver, his buddy, said, what are you doing? Get in this blankety blank truck right now or I'm leaving you. He was scared. He was in shock. Mm -hmm. So not everybody can handle things like that, but uh, especially when they're that close. And, and I understand. I understand. It's not, it's not normal, so to speak. Um, but uh, there's a lot of sightings in Oklahoma, a lot of close sightings. Um, we've had some sightings. I've got a neighbor that lives three miles from here and out of a thunderstorm, he was watching coming out of the West, a triangular shaped ship with no noise. It had lights in the front. No noise was just, it, it was just going, it was going as slow as a helicopter, but absolutely no noise. It went right over his house. Oh, wow. He said it was massive. It was massive. It was, uh, he said probably about the width it was like a it was like a v like a boomerang and he, he said it was going so slow it was like a helicopter but there was no noise and it was coming out of the cloud it came out of the clouds out of the west going due east and went right over him he said it was probably about 500 feet up it wasn't that high see to be honest with you a lot of the reason why this got my attention was because of that stupid thing with Gosh, I really try not to insult people, and I never wish bad on anybody, but there, if there's one person in office I think most honest people will agree on is the one that we don't like in office, and I'm just going to leave it at that. But the fact that he should have told everybody about what was going on with those supposed weather balloons and then me seeing that not mm. two, three days later, and that is definitely not any kind of a balloon. Yeah, I mean... You can tell most people, you can tell, even if you've not seen something over and over, you can look at something going, that's not a weather balloon. You know, that's yeah. not a plane. I should hear something or yeah, it, it's not blinking like a plane. I mean, most people that have seen so many things in the sky since childhood, you kind of know when abnormal sticks out, mm -hmm. whether it's sound, sight, size, it's just not processing with your reference of what you know and then especially if there's other people they're going yeah what is that you know yeah. and so that just corroborates kind of what you're seeing that okay i'm not the only one here you guys are seeing this yeah. weird weirdness too to be honest with you i had almost decided not to say anything to you about it until i heard your uh interview with that man the other day that had had a lot of paranormal experiences yes yes and i thought you know this is, I'm not calling it alien because I don't know that I believe in aliens because I have my own theory on that. Yeah. But, you know, you don't know what it could be, you know? Well, you don't. Um, and everybody is, is free for their own opinion, of course. And that's, that's the great thing. I think it's a great mm -hmm. thing. Um, but, you know, um, I will say that my personal belief of what my studies are and I've been doing a lot of research into this because of other things and writing and all this is that 
when you look at the works of different people who um, have who have achieved and classified documents that mm -hmm. are still classified and some that are declassified, um, our government knows a lot more than what meets the eye. And oh, they've, they've done you. such a good, the government that is, has done such a perfect job, not exactly perfect, but enough of perfect to portray portray that if you believe in this or believe in that, you're a fruitcake, you're, yeah. you're a nut. And people, yeah, they need to make fun of those people, but they know the truth. Yeah. So I will say that. Um, and they've done such a very good job of getting the film industry involved, um, cartoon industry and other industries in the entertainment section sector that um, they make it look like fairy tales and make believe when it's actually very, very real. That's part of what I'm having a problem with, too, being that I saw this with my own eyes, listening to different things that have been online. Um, I have been able to develop my own opinion about it, and I don't, again, like I said, I'm not sure that I'll say that I believe uh, in aliens, because <laughs> they may be alien to us, but I don't believe they're from another galaxy. I do believe uh, in what the Bible says, and... What they're calling aliens could very well be the fallen angels, according to what I've been studying, and that's kind of what I believe, to be honest with you. Sure. They're saying they come out of the planet and whatnot. I know it sounds like a conspiracy theory, but prove it otherwise. Yeah, well, there's a lot of conspiracies that aren't theory. Mm-hmm. Right? They're, they're I real. I agree. And, and then there's some that are. Um, but, yeah, I, I've... I've uh, really pondered that a long time. And, you know, I go back and forth sometimes for sure because I'm a believer. Uh, and I, but I, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about this. And so I'm kind of like, there's, there's weeks where I'm like, yeah. And then there's other weeks where I'm like, well, so again, I haven't drawn any hardcore con uh, conclusions. But I do absolutely, my thoughts are more in line with what you're, what you're saying, for sure. Yeah. I just don't like the idea of calling them what they're calling them and calling that good because I think they're misclassifying. It's a misclassification, mm -hmm. definitely. And if we are mislabeling what this is and people don't catch it for what it is, what's going to happen? Yeah, and I think, yeah, exactly. Well, that's where you don't want to be deceived, right? Exactly. And, you know, we have this term alien of something being foreign and not of the indigenous of where you live. It's not indigenous of this country. We call someone an alien that's outside of that. Well, the alien we're referring to is outside of Earth, planet Earth. Um, so... I'm kind of with you. I wish they'd change the, and, and there's names, depending on who you speak with, they, they have given specific species that mm -hmm. look humanoid and they give them certain names of, you know, mm -hmm. this race, that race. And now I don't know personally how they know all this. And again, if they do, is this something declassified, something that was um, shared by a government official who had firsthand knowledge working on certain uh, unacknowledged special access programs? Uh, probably. But anytime our government gets involved, they always do things the wrong way. And what I mean by that, they, it, it seems like when they reach, they've been studying these, they've been involved in such unique, strange programs since the Roswell incident. Yeah. And so um, when they get involved, uh, the, the big thing, I think, for them right now, and it's been a big thing for a while, just not now, but it's for decades, is this subject of consciousness. And um, but there is some evidence that our government, they don't they go about things a, a very dark way to make to communicate. 
And the dark way they go around is more satanic, which is very, very concerning. Um, okay. for, you know, uh, to entities that they don't need to get into in trying to make contact outward to um, the fallen angels, uh, whether someone calls them aliens. So anyway, they always go about it the wrong and hard way to do things. Our, our government, it seems like. And what I mean by that, too, is I was looking, reading declassified materials that was released by the CIA a couple of years ago that my brother Bill sent me that was official, declassified. And it talks about exactly what they're, I mean, it's page after page after page after page. And of course, someone to read this declassify the CIA website, they don't put anything in order. It's just yeah. thousands of pages. Now, the project will be in order. But you'll have just a smattering, and it's all over the place. There's nothing cataloged very well and in any type of order. You just have to go page after page after page, just arduous reading of material to find something interesting. Mm-hmm. Well, we've got something else. Okay. Because, you know, we were talking about oddities. Yeah. And I haven't really pointed it out that much to my husband, and I don't think I'm going to quite yet because he's going to get a trail cam, and he's trying to figure out how to get it set up. We got chickens. We, we've got one acre of property now. Oh, okay, and, good. And we've got scratch marks going halfway up a about eight-foot-tall chicken coop. Okay, back up here. You've got scratch marks halfway up a chicken coop. Uh, mm -hmm. how high did you say? This chicken coop is about, I'd say, let's see, it's about at my hips. So I'd say about three foot off the ground and the inside of it's about four foot tall. So four, five, six, seven, maybe seven foot tall, eight foot tall. And the scratch marks are halfway up it. Hmm. So either we've got really large wolves or, um, a raccoon that knows how to climb. And that's possible. What? Tell me what the scratch mark. Did you take a picture of them? No, I haven't. I haven't had a chance to yet. I think I'm going to try to go out and do that tomorrow. So what you're going to look for is really the the size of the scratch mark. In other words, the the width, the how deep, um, the length, um, the I don't want to say amplitude. I'm thinking something else. But the depth of the scratch and the width of the scratch. So if you have a scratch that each one is a quarter inch wide, uh, then you know you're dealing with some type of a claw. Uh, now, raccoons do have, they have digits. That's how they can get into your picnic, you know, chest and all that stuff and steal your food, literally. And they actually have opposing little thumb. They can open quite a few things, believe it or not. And they're pretty smart, uh, but their claws are not so big. They'll claw things, but it, it's it's, they're small in comparison. So, yeah. and depending on how the scratch marks, I mean, you, are there three, are there two, are there five, are there four, you know, not that that would be perfect because not all circumstances. I mean, you can have a bear make a claw mark on a tree for territorial purposes and only get three of the four claws or five rather. Uh, so that's not always a, an exact uh, um, science with that. But, um, yeah, do take a picture of that and just kind of see. Um, I'll send it to you when I take a picture. Um, yeah. Even telling my husband, it, it's kind of like when we were living in, hmm. that I've been having feelings, again, of being watched. And I told him, you can feel where it's coming from. It's coming from the tree line. And I've pointed out to him several times, I feel like we're being watched. And I tell him it's coming from that direction. And every time it happens... That's when this happens. And I'm not clairvoyant. I think I just have very good women's intuition. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and where you live again, um, is it, tell me about the area a little bit as far as the topography. Tell me, is there a lot of homes close by? Is it a very rural um, area? Is it a small town you live in outside of a is, small town? It is a small town and we're right off the railroad track. We are not by any close creeks this time. Um, we are pretty much in the middle of a field. Uh, let me give you the address and you can pull it up and look at it. Okay. Look, uh, look at it. I see where you're at. Interesting. I, I've never been. I, I mean, I've, I've been to a lot of towns in Oklahoma, but never that. 
That's yeah, a lot of people don't realize it's a town. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we it's didn't a, even know until we moved there. <laughs> it's a quaint town. Well, there's, and there's there's so many little towns dotted through not only Oklahoma but the United States that are having very strange sightings and ongoing, and it's just it never gets mentioned because people don't want to talk about it because they don't want to be finger pointed at. They don't want to be labeled as anything or they hold a certain position in community or their occupation. So they don't want to talk about it. And unfortunately things have been going on in these towns like that for long time, years. And people have a sense of what's going on because they've seen them. They just kind of, um, don't ask, don't tell. Um, Brush it under the rug. If they kill a couple calves a year, just leave it be, um, or well, whatever. See, when we first moved to, into our house, we saw a man walking in the field behind our house, and um, he was walking with a rifle. And I thought, okay, that's weird. And I asked him what he was doing. He said, Oh, I'm out here hunting for wolves. He says, Have you seen any? And I said, no, we haven't seen any local packs. I mean, we passed a pack or two every now and then. There'd be one or two together, but never a large pack. Mm-hmm. And that's when we were told that there were large packs roaming in the area. We don't let anybody leave our house unless we walk out with them to their vehicles, and then we'll go back into the house because we go out armed. But he told us that uh, he has to hunt his property frequently. I, apparently, he's the farmer. And that there are large wolves in the area. Hmm. Interesting. Now, you know, and that's always interesting because we always call something what our common sense reference says. So, uh, you know, are people misidentifying a dog man type creature with a wolf or a wolf with a dog man creature? don't know depending on the distance you know and people just kind of go to that because they're very canine in nature obviously the way they they appear they're just much bigger uh but there's wolves around and that's one thing i thought that's very interesting you say that um i have a neighbor lives about as the crow flies maybe about a little over three miles from me right now and him and his son just outside of uh, manford oklahoma there was a pack of wolves he said 20 plus uh, gray, black, um, and some were like a, a calico color with gray tips. He said they crossed right in front of him over, over the highway. He said, and I said, you know, I just said, well, Jerry, are you sure it was wolves? And he said, listen, and I knew what I was going to get a little bit of back backlash. You know, he's like, listen, Lance. I know what dogs, what size dogs are. I know different breeds of dogs. I know coyotes. I know coyote sizes. He goes, these were wolves. If I was to stand outside, he goes, these wolves came up to the fender well of my truck. So, which would be about to the waistline of a man. And he said, these were like 120 to 150 pound wolves. He said, they were wolves. And he says, no one wants to acknowledge them that they exist in Oklahoma, but they do. They do, and they do run in packs, and they do hunt in packs, and they do exist. Mm -hmm. And and I said, I have heard that. I, you're just the first that, well, not the first. I've heard it also in eastern Oklahoma. I came upon a bow hunter. We were out, and he said he saw a pack of three wolves that were running together. Now, what was interesting about what he said. He said he was down out of his tree, this this bow hunter. He got out of his tree and he saw this pack. He said they were massive. He didn't tell me like what, you know, that's, you always want to reference someone what is huge to someone, what is massive, what is small. What's the reference point? And he just said they were huge. And I never really pursued that because this was way before I really got into this subject matter. And I should have really kind of brought home that subject, like how big. And he said they were, they were on the hunt. They were about 65 yards out and he just kind of backed into the tree and tried to blend with the tree and the wind was in his favor. He said, thank gosh. And he goes, I was down and my bow was near my, 
was on the ground because he had lowered the bow down. He had just got out of the tree. He was stretching. And then that's when he saw them and he stood, he was just froze. So I think there's some misidentification, I think in many cases. It's possible. I, I wouldn't doubt it <clears throat> because to be honest with you, these, if it was wolves that have been trying to get into our chicken coop, they've been trying to get in through where the uh, eggs are. Uh, I can't remember what you call that thing. Um, my husband's the one who uh, handles the handles the chickens. I, I just go out there and collect eggs every now and then. Okay. Um, the little nesting boxes, I think. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, there were scratches around the top of that, and then there are scratches around the door, but the door goes all the way up to the roof of this building that he's built, mm. and there were scratches at the roof. Wow. Yeah. So um, these things would have to be big, but... Yeah, and... Not just, not just that. We've got a couple of bloodhounds, and we've been keeping them inside when it's been, you know, below freezing at night. But mm. we have nights when we come home, they are looking every direction but at us when we're getting out of our vehicles. I mean, they'll bark at us. They want us to come over there, pet them, give them some food, mm -hmm. say hi. But there are times when we come home, especially like those nights I told you where I'm having those feelings of being watched. I turn around and I go to look, and these dogs are not barking at me. They are barking in any direction but the direction I'm at. Hmm. And you, these feelings that you had, you said that you really not had them in, uh, until the first time we spoke, which mm -hmm. was in another town. And you would go mm -hmm. walking at night with your mm -hmm. dog or running. Mm -hmm. Was it running or walking? Nope, walking. Walking. And then that's when you had this eerie feeling that something was following you or watching you. Right? Mm hmm Yep. Hmm. Well, you know, I tell people, um, go with that first instinct. If, if something, if you get that funny feeling that you are being watched or followed, then you are. I mean, it's, it's not a... It's kind of hard. It's one of those uh, feelings I think is, is that God put in is for survival, you know, yep. when danger's around. And I tell people, sometimes you can't put your finger on it, but that's okay. You don't have to analyze it. You just have to respond to that feeling, you know, yep. um, and, and act upon it. If it says get away, then get away. If it says get in your car, lock the doors, then get in your car and lock the doors. Whatever that, that instinct says. Um, but... Um, so you've been, how long, so you've been at the property, how long did you say two years ago, uh, two years? Yeah, we've been, we've lived here for about two years now. Okay. And nothing up until this point was odd at this point. It's just, it's just been kind of a buildup. Like I said, like, um, hmm. those scratches on the chicken coop and then me having those feelings didn't really happen until after those scratches on the chicken coop actually this has only been about a, t about a last two month, three month thing. Okay. And we've been kind of being a little bit more careful because of winter, because we don't want our dogs to die. And we're trying to teach my eldest how to take care of the animals. Mm. So um, she's just now learning how to take the food out there properly, how to water them properly, and all that. Um, we had to wait until we moved into a house where she could learn. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's all beginning for her. Um, but I will say it's been different. Uh, we love it out there that this is exactly where we want to live. I mean, we're technically in town, but we're not. Mm -hmm. We're out in the middle of nowhere, but we're not. You know, I mean, we can get to things in 15, 20 minutes easily, but our neighbors aren't stretch your arm out and say hi. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like where we live. We're mm -hmm. very close. We're a mile away from town, but town is not much of a town, but it's it's a very sweet community. Um, very um, quaint, if you will. If you build, there's no grocery store or anything like that or gas station, but there's people there. I, I wanted to ask you something since you're a pretty avid hunter, because we're we're hunters, but we haven't been in a while. We don't really have any place to go at the moment. But that's not my question. Have you been hearing much about the wild hog issues here lately? Just in general in Oklahoma? Uh-huh. Um, the latest that I've heard, it's kind of interesting you say that, is uh, 
it seems like there is, I don't know if it's a, uh, a, a mixture of breeds or what's happened, but apparently there is a, a, a new, I don't want to say specie, um, a larger breed of wild hogs that's now being seen that is quite a bit larger than these feral hogs or wild hogs that are typical, typically shot or seen on uh, river bottoms or farmers' properties or things like that. And it's they're a bigger hog, much bigger. That's That's what I've heard. The reason why I'm asking, I have a very good reason for asking, and okay. maybe you can answer this for me. All the way up till about three years ago, I had been hearing nonstop about how Oklahoma had been being run over by wild hogs. And mm -hmm. I know they've opened up hunting for it. Uh, hunters have been killing them on their properties and whatnot. So that's going to bring down the, the birth rate and whatnot. But I haven't heard anything about wild hogs in at least two, th two to three years. And, and honestly, all I've been hearing about lately are birds. I have not been hearing, I mean, wild turkey, you, you know, all the weird birds and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard a thing about wild hogs in two to three years. And I've been asking, but a lot of people have told me maybe they just got the population under control. Uh, well, there's a lot more people, there's a lot, there's a lot more people hunting them, I would say, uh, both for sport and some people eat their meat. Um, but they're still very, very prevalent, very much a nuisance. Uh, they destroy the property, they contaminate gardens. I mean, if someone really has a garden out in the open and you're in an area where there's hogs, you really need to seriously fence it off. And when I say fence it off. I mean, they'll burrow underneath and dig and destroy it. And of course they, they'll leave their fecal material everywhere. And now you run the risk of E. coli contamination, especially in yeah. spinach and cabbage and lettuces and things like that. But, um, yeah, it's still around. Um, I don't know about the population rates in Oklahoma. That's not something that I kind of off the top of my head, but I do know people that do go out and hunt, they never have a problem finding them. Uh, and they never have a problem seeing uh, enough. They, they, there's plenty out there. Um, so there's just, you know, sometimes when you get into your remote river bottom areas, I mean, they're all over the place. Uh, it's really hard to control them. And what's really fascinating about hogs is that most animals require a certain number of months for maturity before they reach a maturity level of uh, what they call sexual maturation or before they can have offspring themselves, right? Uh, it's only like six months for a pig, isn't it? It's less than that. It is, it is like within about three months, they can be having babies themselves. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's what's really crazy. That's why they proliferate so much is that, and here's the thing about hogs. That's very, very odd. They're one of the smart, smartest creatures out in the wild, believe it or not. Now, See? what we deem smart is they remember sounds. They remember food pl places, plots. Um, if you call them up, which you can, They'll remember that sound and they'll, and if you start shooting at them and you miss, they'll equate that particular sound with shot. I mean, they're pretty smart. Uh, you don't think so being a pig, a hog, but they are. Go ahead. You were going to say yeah. something. Yeah. Um, when we first moved to our new little town, uh, we had a friend tell us about a farmer that was allowing uh, some of the wild hogs to breed on his property and he was using it for hunting purposes. He okay. Was come out and hunt them mm -hmm. and my husband was going to go and approach the man to see if he possibly could do some hunting out there and he said that the herd had disappeared something like overnight now here's the thing i will say about that and it, it's kind of getting to i've heard that in numerous times in certain areas so since we don't have any direct evidence for this, we can yeah. kind of theorize or, or speculate, if you will. But I think the speculation or the theories are one of them 
or a series of both of them collectively, somewhere lies the truth, if you will. So I think, number one, can hogs migrate into another area if it's not wet enough, cool enough, uh, and has the right food sources for them? Of course they can. Of course they do. All the time. Mm -hmm. uh, they go to where they're safe and they don't have to, you know, they're like anything. They don't want to be bothered. And if they're bothered a lot or shot at, they'll move somewhere else. So that can happen. Um, so the other thing, though, can they get diseased and they can die off? It's possible. Yes. Now, I will say this. I do know that the federal state and federal governments, there was a plan enacted, maybe not last year, the year before. I found out about a year ago. They were using um, food they were dumping that had um, a, they called it a poison, but really what it was was a blood thinner. And the hogs ate it, and they bled to death internally, believe it or not. Um, mm -hmm. So that's how they killed them. Unfortunately, the food could be an attractant to other animals as well. You can't discriminate, you know, what animal is going to eat that and what animal is going to eat that. You, you don't know. So if any animal eats it, they're going to, you know, get this, um, this blood thinning agent that's in the food, and they'll die too. So... They may have, and they were going to do these aerial drops for these food for hogs. Now that's another possibility in, in highly, high concentrated areas where there's hog populations. But right. the last part that we do know that can affect hog populations are creatures living in the area. Well, that was where, where I was going. Or, or because wolves. If we do have wolves in the area, that could talk about where the hogs yes, are. Yes, yes. They might be following the migration. That's very true um, because it is a very, very common food source, big food source of protein in Oklahoma along with deer. But hogs are so prevalent. They're like ticks. I mean, they're everywhere. And when you get the average size of hog... I, I don't know if I was going to put an average size, if there's an average size, I'd say 200 pounds. Have, mm -hmm. Are there ones that are much bigger? These boars? Absolutely. Can sows get large, you know, a, more of a female? Hog? Yes, very large. You can get 200, 300, 400 pounds too. It depends on where their food sources are, what kind of fat and protein is involved. Hogs that get really big tend to uh, harbor around uh, cattle. These, uh, uh, stock pens where a lot of corn is given out and just uh, extraneous corn is is not it it's, it misses the the uh, uh, the feed bins and it gets slopped over the sides. Well, hogs will come in and eat that up. Well, if they've got adequate food source, they just keep fatter and fatter and bigger and bigger and bigger. So um, you're right, wolves can do that too. Wolves in an area, but the other aspect of that, cryptids. We know that too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I figure whatever it is has to be pretty big to reach the top of that chicken coop. Now, I mean, it yes. is right next to our four foot tall fence, but it, there's about four foot between the chicken coop and the four foot tall fence. Mm. So even if it was to climb up on the four foot tall fence, it would have a... You'd have a reach. Yeah. Hmm. That is something. Now, that's different. You have to have um, some height. Yeah. You would have to have and some height. I, I pointed out to my husband and I asked him what he thought it was. And he told me he thought it was a raccoon getting on top of the uh, chicken, you know, because he's he always thinks about the most. Well, the logical possible. Yeah. yeah the most that, logical reasoning. Yeah. And, and that's mm -hmm. what when you're trying to debunk something, you should include what is the most logical. You know, when it comes to a camera that's not working right, well, is it plugged in? Is there batteries? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, no. Okay. That's what it was. It wasn't a ghostly apparition. You know, um, you need to think of the logical. Uh, and then as you go through, okay, wait, can a raccoon do that? Can a raccoon climb this? Uh, yeah, it could. Can it leave deep gouges that are quarter inch deep? Um, no, not really. Not unless... You can see the size of the claws unless it was going after it and going after it and going after it and removing wood. Um, it could try to bite if it's a corner, if they really want in. 
Now, could it be a feral dog? You know, there's some big dogs that are out there, and there's dogs, unfortunately, that are feral. So they're not really a wolf. Uh, they have canine abilities, and then, unfortunately, when wild dogs get a um, hankering, if you will, or they've killed um, birds or turkeys or chickens or geese or ducks or whatnot, whether it be uh, farming livestock or otherwise, it's really hard to remove that affinity for killing, even from a domesticated dog that went feral. It's oh, yeah. it's very hard to remove that. So that's where humans could be in danger, of course. But if they know chickens are in there, you can have a feral dog. Is it possible that high? It is, but not likely. Not likely, because that's really high. Well, I know raccoons are smart, too. Mm -hmm. But I don't necessarily agree with my husband on the raccoon angle, even though it is going after the locks, the scratches go all the way up the door. It's not just around like where the locks are. Well, I will say this too. It seems like in previous episodes of Encounters that if we were talking like a dogman creature that, and I don't want to say that all of them have an opposing thumb because that would be categorizing all of them went I'm, I'm not 100% on that. I don't have that knowledge base of that. But I will say, of a lot of the encounters, um, people have seen an, a thumb digit, and they have been able to twist locks, unscrew light bulbs, open doors, open latches, uh, take a false lock where there's a lock on something, and they'll take it off twist and pull it off because they have an opposing thumb. So mm -hmm. if there was a latch on something that wasn't locked, the dogman creature in most of the interviews that I've done have the ability to do that. Uh, now, that saying that all of them have an opposing thumb, which I cannot make that statement 100% because I don't know, is there could there be hybrids that have do not have an opposing thumb? Sure, why not? There could be a hybrid that looks more like a wolf, but is extremely larger. Um, mm -hmm. So we just, this is kind of information we're devoid of and some of the anatomy we're devoid of, but people do know there are people out there that do know. I say the people, I would say that there's more state and federal officials that do know. Uh, I believe it. Yeah. And then with me seeing that the other day, I just, you know, you put it all together and it's not forming a very good picture. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and the other thing, too, is that I'm still kind of in alignment with your husband. Uh, wolves are very smart, but they are, do they have the ability to see infrared? Sure, they do. But they're still prone to do canine things and have uh, behaviors that won't, if they see that infrared, they won't really leave. They're, because the infrared really doesn't hurt them. They, they might see it, but they won't remove themselves from it. They'll still continue going after the food, typically with wolves. So right. I would put a camera, if there's not one there, put a camera and, you know, put a camera one in and then put a camera on the camera where you can still get what you want in the middle if it's a chicken coop. But if you can have a camera looking at one side and the camera looking at the other camera, kind of that, I, I really like that concept a bit more. Because uh, you're dealing with creatures, uh, it's really hard to remove one camera and then remove the other. You know, you've got to have a team or something if they're that smart. But wolves won't, I mean, they're smart, but not like dogman smart, so to speak. So that might be something, having a camera there where you can see if it comes. Because if it wasn't successful in getting a chicken and it was hungry, the likelihood of it coming back is very high. Yeah. Well, he has them pretty well trained to come in when the sun goes down. They go in, but I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, that'll be interesting. So He's been trying to get it set up. I don't know. I, I'm wondering if uh, he was having issues getting it to record. He had it on the door, and he said it blanked out like three hours in, and it's supposed to be a 12-hour record. Say that one more time. 
he said that the camera blanked out about three hours in and it was supposed to be a 12 hour recording thing. Huh. And he hasn't been able, or I don't know if he set it back up to be honest with you, but um, as far as I understand, he hasn't been able to get anything on the camera yet. That's strange. Hmm. Now, uh, you know, all we can do is chalk it up to strange, right? We can't draw any hardcore conclusions, but you can, uh, that's why I like tandem cameras because it's possible one could fail. And then sometimes I like to get cameras that, um, oh, you can hook up an external source to it and have like a battery buried or attached to a tree. I like to put my cameras up high too. I don't like to put them at the four foot level. I like to put yeah, my he had put it on the four foot fence and he had set it to motion. Okay. I like to put mine up if you can, like 15 feet, 10, 15, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, because even animals smelling scents on humans and things like that, they might not hang around, but as long as you let it gas out a while outside, when you first get a camera and just let it, uh, you know, be exposed to the sun, let it things gas out from the plastics, then this should be problem after that. But putting it up a little bit higher is always great. I, I just had very good success with that. Um, I'll suggest you put it on the house then. Maybe that'll work. Yeah. I mean, that's another idea. For sure. How? So, have, have you kept in contact? Probably not, but I'm going to ask. Have you kept in contact with um, anyone that experienced anything back home from what you experienced? No, Nate, none of them have talked to me since I moved. I'm a traitor. I moved away. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was just curious because you also had the experience of something coming in the garage, right? Yeah. Um, no, um, I'm the one that had the experience when I was walking at night with my poodle. And I, I agree with you. I think it had followed me home the next day. Mm -hmm. Um Well, not the next day. It was probably three or four days later. But anyway, yeah, it tried to come in through the garage and it jammed the door. I just thought that was a very hair-raising moment that you heard the garage door come up. You were in the house that I, I'm just recalling, so correct me if I'm wrong. And you thought you were just delivering groceries. I'm going off memory here. You were delivering groceries. You, mm -hmm. um, you came in and you thought, the garage door was going to go down. You thought it was your husband and you had shut the door behind you. And then you thought it was kind of strange because he hadn't come in yet. Um, now I can't recall at this point, it's a little sketchy if you ever heard the garage door go back down or you, you when you knew that something was different. Let's see if I remember correctly, it's been a while since it happened, but I came in, I had my groceries out in the car, I locked the car, I shut the garage door behind me because I still needed to carry in, but I had to go to the ladies' room. And on my way to the ladies' room, I heard the garage door go back up, and I went back. I had finished using the bathroom, and I had went back because I thought it was weird my husband hadn't come back in at that point. And when I went to turn the doorknob, the doorknob started turning under my hand. Hmm. That's right. And um, at that, by that point, I knew my husband was already home and he was in bed because I had looked into the room and he was going to come help me carry uh, groceries. That's right. So That's right. I knew it wasn't him trying to come in. So I stopped the doorknob and I knew I had whatever it was or whoever it was trapped in the garage. And I started yelling for my husband to come and help me and we ended up jamming the door to the garage. And then the garage door started opening up again uh, when I went out to go try to stop or catch whoever or whatever it was. So it left because the garage door went up and it went out. Yep. Yep. Wow. Well, you know, you think about it, could that have been a person? Possible. But under the circumstances with everything that kind of led up to that point it sure didn't sound like it was a human no it, it didn't especially 
Now, this is something I've heard through other people with their cryptid events before, and I never associated it until my neighbor had told me about it. And my neighbor told me that uh, the same day when I had gone for my walk, uh, or the same night that I had gone for my walk and saw what I, I saw, um, they had a break-in at the uh, at a local, uh, what do you call it, cemetery. Hmm. And... It was in one of the crypts. Don't know what happened other than that. I know the door was broken and off its hinges, and the police thought that there were teenagers that were trying to break into one of the crypts, and it wasn't. I remember uh, you saying that. Yeah. Yeah. And we all, the neighbors and everybody, thought it was funny because they knew about what had happened with me um, the night previous. Uh, but nobody wanted to tell me about it. The one neighbor told us about it because he just thought it was hilarious. And <clears throat> he said, being what happened to me, that everybody just thought it was hilarious because some kid must be playing some kind of a prank. I mean... You can't fake what I saw. No, I mean, no. This was... thing was bigger than a van. This was bigger than any truck or SUV. I could see distinguishing factors on it. And there aren't any bears that are that big. I mean, I've seen them, like, at the zoo, as big as a van. This, I was a good quarter, half mile away looking at the thing, and it was as big as the first story of a building, at least. Mm, I remember the shadow you said that was going along the wall. Uh -huh. And how so you could big... follow the shadow along the wall of the, the cafeteria that was there. Yeah. yeah. And you know what's really interesting is that I remember in another encounter that of a young man that had a very frightening experience here in Tulsa. And he always, after he got off work, um, I won't say where he worked, but he got off work late. And he would take his dog that was in his apartment and just to kind of wind down because he worked the late shift, he would go to a park. And he would go to this park, and he knew kind of a back way or another way, because usually they close the main gates. He would go to another way that's always been access to him, and because he just knew where they didn't really close this part of the park. And he would always go through this one area, and he would go in there, and there was no lights on in the park. But he would go on nights, the, the light sky, there's enough, city lights to kind of light up the sky where even though there's no lights in the area, it still was light enough you could see things. And so he would actually take a Frisbee and play Frisbee. It was in the dark, but he could see with his dog. Well, my point in bringing that up is he said that he encountered a dogman creature that looked as big as an ATV, a four-seater. And he thought it was as he was turning around, as he was turning this corner in his truck and his headlights were going kind of in a path kind of across the woods, he saw something black to the right and he thought it was an ATV with the lights off. It was big, like a, like a, well, some of these ATVs or, or side-by-sides are quite large, especially when they have tandem seating front to back. And he right. thought it was some people riding around in the park at night just to kind of have some fun with their lights off. But as it came into his light he slowed down and as it came into his headlights he realized real quick what it was or what it wasn't and it was a dogman creature that was on two legs it was bent forward so far forward he said that if it would have been a human you'd, they'd have fell over but it was such at a slant moving forward with its arms up he said it was it was kind of a, it, was, it was at a good trot but it was like it had its arms up kind of like a t-rex and it looked over his it looked over its shoulder at him and gave this snarling sinister looking grin and it 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 scared him i mean it completely frightened him it terrorized him he just he just froze like what am i looking at and it scared him so bad that where he lives with plenty of apartments plenty of lighting on the street he didn't want to walk down the street with his dog for a long time. Oh, and wow. I um, I tried and tried and tried and tried over the course of weeks, months, a year. I waited two years to try and get, um, make an interview. Uh, I wouldn't air his face or anything. I would just kind of point 
the camera at me trying to go to that location in Tulsa because I knew exactly where he was at, uh, or at least in the vicinity where he said he was at. Um, and I never, I never could make contact with him. I, th I think what happened is that we spoke quite frequently there for a while and he went back to this area that was never locked and all of a sudden it became locked. And I told him, you need to be careful if there are other people that know about these creatures, they're going to be monitoring anyone in that area that looks suspicious. So if you go and you see a vehicle backed in, most people pull in, 99% of people pull in. But if you see a vehicle backed in, like say an officer would be or a sheriff, and they don't have any identifiable markings on the car that it's a police officer or sheriff, be very careful that you're dealing with people that um, could be at a federal level. These, what I call corporate guys, uh, these MIBs, but they're, they're corporate is what they are. They're just corporate agents is all they are. They're, they're like uh, uh, mercenaries, so to speak. And I said, be careful. Well, he actually called me back. He said, guy, I had Lance, I had a guy follow me. I went to the gate, I got out, I looked, and there was a lock on it. I was very surprised. And there was only one truck there. He was backed in, like you said. Um, it was a white truck, very dark tinted windows, and I left, and he followed me. So I went in through the park, and the park has a lot of winding corners and dead ends and all this stuff. So you got to know where you're going. And he did, being familiar with the area. And he said there's this one area that's a blind spot. So he went in, turned around real quick and coming back the other way. And he passed this truck and slowed down. And he looked real quick and it had a U.S. government tag. So anyway, I think that freaked him out. He told me in his tone, in his demeanor, I think it really freaked him out of what was going on over this whole thing. It got deep very fast. And then we just kind of lost contact. So hmm. uh, very strange encounter, uh, terrifying. And just the events that followed was very strange in, indeed. So, like but anyway, I bring that up just basically because the size that he saw was like an ATV, massive, massive. So I, I wish I would have thought to try to record what I saw, but to be honest with you, it wasn't even a matter of trying to think of it. Even if I had a thought to get my phone out to record, I wouldn't have had enough time. I didn't see it that well that night. Mm. Yeah. Well, everything happened so fast. That's why some of the, I mean, how many amazing videos would people have? But, you know, we don't run our phones all the time. We're not photojournalists who are trained mm -hmm. to take a picture at the, you know, they have to have, They've got cameras all over them, and they're trained to take a picture before they think. And there are so many of these encounters, I think, that people have had that they're just afraid to tell. Um, they they question what they saw. I surely didn't see that. And who knows how many are out there. Um, because the odd thing is, some of these sightings, some of these very close encounters happen well within a city limit area that how could this occur within city limits of a metro area and it's almost seems so unplausible uh almost to a level of ridiculous like get, yeah. get out of here get out of here well, yeah. you've got a creature this monster looking creature inside the tulsa city limits give me a break but here's the thing with tulsa it's not really a huge metro area and there's waterways, there's dark alleys, there's plenty of creeks and tributaries going in and through neighborhoods that are very deep and dark. You could easily slip in neighborhoods and that's what happened with one guy. I went to his house in Tulsa and he has a creek that runs behind all of the houses that is quite wide and it goes under the street deep. So it came in from a field. It could go into the neighborhood and slip in all the way deep into the interior of this neighborhood. And people are stacked right next to each other in there like Monopoly homes. Yet it can, yet he saw it in his backyard. 
So it can happen anywhere. It really can. I, I wouldn't be surprised. And, you know, we are country people. We love living in the country. So it's not surpri surprising to me that I see this stuff. This isn't an everyday thing either. And a lot of people seem to think that everybody who has these encounters has these daily, nightly, hourly. Yeah. That's, it, not, that's not the thing. I mean, we're, no. talking, we're talking a space of five years and in three different locations. That's exactly right. And, you know, I was having this conversation the other night, uh, well, the other night, last week, about there are some people that have multiple encounters, whether it be over a course of a few months, a few years, or a decade, and more than a, a few encounters, sometimes five, six, seven, or more. So how can that be? How can that be? Um, you know, trying to use logic here, number one, it's where they live. Do they live in a rural area where there's not too many people crowded together, like where you live, like where I live? So that's that's possible. You know, you, you we don't have a neighbor like right next to, we do, but we don't. My neighbor is probably about 400 yards from where I'm sitting. So they're not like right next door, but they are. I have to go through the timber a little bit and then I can knock on their door, you know. Um, but uh, there's no one to the other side of me for another half mile. So number one, it's where you live. Number two, are, do you live near water, uh, a creek or a large water source or a lake? Uh, three, is there a lot of livestock around or food sources? Um, so any of those things could make it more likely to have an appearance or a sighting of these creatures, absolutely. And you know, lastly, I get into this and I can't put my finger on it, I can speculate all day long, but I still can't prove it. But then again, you can't disprove it. I think people, some people, have an affinity to know things, let's just say, or see things more often than other people. They're more aware. They're more aware of their surroundings. Therefore, they know what to kind of look at. Like they, they, they're in tune with something doesn't feel right. You know, I, I feel like I'm being watched and the other person's like, I don't feel anything, you know? So I, I think being in kind of in tune to whether you want to call it the Holy Spirit or that innate feeling God gave us or whatever a person wants to call it, I think they're more in tune to that. And you start to do that when you're in the country. Uh, your senses are heightened up a little bit more. You're more aware of things. Um, and I think a lot of people have this affinity or ability, except that it takes a while to kind of get accustomed to that when you're in the country a little bit, if you go from the city to the country, um, and a little bit more. So if you're going hunting, it takes me a couple days to kind of get in tune with paying attention to, um, wind direction, smells, um, paying attention to the animals, what they're, what they're doing, what are they, what's their sounds, you know, is there danger around or whatever? I'm not comfortable with sharing other people's stories, but oh. I can tell you my own. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. In Oklahoma City, and I'm not going to say what one or the exact location because too many people already think that particular cemetery is haunted. Okay. But we thought that, uh, there was a break-in happening in one of the chapels that uh, is also considered a crypt. They do have people buried in the walls. They had the little name tags and whatnot. I oh, know. like a mausoleum? Yeah, mausoleum. Thank you. Uh -huh. I had the wrong name in my head. No, that's okay. Um, but we went in to go see what was going on, and we were walking around a fresh grave. And my boss was walking the property with me because I w did not feel comfortable walking it on my own for religious reasons. Sure, sure. Uh, and they had turned their backs to me. My back was to the fresh grave. And all of a sudden, I got shoved by some unseen force into the grave, the fresh, freshly dug grave. Oh, there was still an open hole? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. For the funeral the following day, and I got shoved into it from the front. And all my boss and the uh, the caretaker heard was laughter. They turned around, and I was gone, screaming my head off at the bottom of a freshly dug grave. Let's just say I got sent home early. Good night. 
they said that they could see footsteps on the dew on the ground because this was the middle of summer. And you could see I was standing two foot out from the grave. There's no way I should have fallen into it. You could see these footsteps had approached me, shoved me, and I fell in. They thought literally somebody had ran up behind them and shoved me in. But by the time they had turned around, there was nobody there, and there was nothing to hide behind because it was a fresh area where they were digging new graves. There weren't any gravestones. There weren't any trees. It was about a five-acre area with nothing to hide behind. And all you saw were the footsteps approaching where I was at, and I was in the grave, and they were having to try to help my big booty out of that grave, and I weighed close to 300 pounds at the time. So you wow. got two overweight gentlemen trying to pull a 300-pound woman that's screaming her head off and freaking out out of the grave. Wow. Yeah. I'm so sorry you went through that. That's that was. I'm sure that was terrifying. Yeah. And and they didn't see that. They just they turned around and you were just gone. Yeah. But you know what happened. They heard the laughter. I didn't hear the laughter. I just wow. got shoved back and I don't know if I blacked out or what. I just remember wow. opening my eyes up and I started screaming at the bottom of this grave. Well, yeah. I mean, without getting too detailed on things, I'll just say, you know as well as I do, there are there are there are things that uh, I'll just say uh, unrested spirits, if you want to call them that at this point in time, there's a couple different that uh, we don't know their don't intentions. Believe, I don't believe you can be Christian without believing in ghosts because the Bible talks about it in too many different places. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> Lord talks about, you know, leave the dead into the dead. Don't, basically, don't don't be talking to the dead because mm -hmm. he doesn't go in a lot more detail uh, be amongst the living, but basically there's nothing good you're going to get out of it, mm -mm. you know, and we can't discern. Our eyes cannot see into this, this realm. And now some people, uh, is it possible? Sure. Anything's possible. I can't, I can't, of course, but that's why since it's, you can't see it, you've got to be, you just don't want to go there. You do not want to go in there. And of course, um, I had a gentleman on Reverend Dave who we had like four shows with him. Uh, he, he got into this quite detailed and uh, he was just talking about it. It's, it's too dangerous to get involved in that. That's why you leave the dead into the dead. You stay in prayer, fervent prayer with the Lord and he will protect you. Uh, but you don't want to open those doors because once you open those doors, and some people, young people, unfortunately, don't know what they're doing. They find it, oh, this is cool, this is mysterious, this is intriguing. Well, no, it's not. It can be very, very dangerous. And you don't know what you're doing. And you don't know what you're opening. So just don't go there. Um, but that is so scary. I'm sure that uh, that's really a strange event that happened. Um, yeah. Wow. Wow. I, I texted my girlfriend and she just told me I could tell you about the haunted house if you want to hear it. Oh, please, please. She every year she does security for a haunted house and there is one room in this particular haunted house. I'll tell you where it's at, but I would appreciate it if you bleep it out. OK. Now, when you say haunted house, is this something like when you say like in October for, yeah. for Halloween haunted house? Yeah. OK. Mm -hmm. So, um, OK. Okay. Yeah, I know exactly where it's at. Yep. She does security for it every year. Well, this one particular year, she was doing the security in there, and there's this crooked -y old elevator that they would use to go up to the top floor. Now, the people that walk through this building, they walk up the stairs to go to the top floor, but the people that do the show and everything, they use the elevator. But the, they've replaced it since this happened, but... They had issues with the crickety old elevator glitching. And what this elevator would do, or the, the best way I can think of, of describing this elevator is like in the old movies, it had this cage that you had to pull down and another one you had to pull shut before oh. you could even hit the buttons to make it go up and down. Yeah. 
uh, you know, that building's a really, really old building. Hmm. Um, and they had been getting reports that particular night. It was probably the third or fourth week that they had been doing the haunted houses that there was something going on in the basement of that building. Hmm. Well, so she does have a partner and she tells her partner what's going on. And it's pretty much an unspoken rule. If you have to walk through the haunted house, you walk through with your partner or you, you stay in constant radio contact. Well, their radios that particular night for some reason weren't working. So she was having to wait on him to come down to her to go to the basement so they could see what was going on. Okay. Um, they had had teenagers break in in the past and they pretty much figured that's what this was. That in the basement, they have all the old costumes. They have old decorations and whatnot from like previous years. Um, things that people could use to change up their scenes as they wanted in their different district areas in the haunted house, right? Okay. Um, they go down, or, well, he gets down to her, and uh, apparently the elevator had been glitching pretty bad that night because when he went to get off, he said he had to step up like two foot to get out of the elevator. It didn't stop where it was supposed to. Okay. Uh, he was worried that he was going to have to go down to the basement, come back up and get her, and then go and walk the basement. They go, and they um, hope I'm giving this in the best way possible. I'm telling it from what I remember of the story she told me. Okay. So they go, and they get on the elevator, and she told me she recalled having to step down to get into the elevator, and she's short like me. I'm only five foot four. So stepping down two foot is asking you to step down almost your whole entire leg. <laughs> yeah, that's a big step. Yeah. So she gets down in there with him, and they go down to the bottom in the basement. And when they get to the bottom, you know, the old elevators will jerk either way when you hit. Mm -hmm. She said when they hit the bottom, when they hit the basement, it was more or less... It wasn't a jerk. It was like the thing had fallen and hit the floor. Hmm. They wrote it down. So she was afraid there was something going on with it. So they actually put a sign on the elevator stating for people not to use it after that. And they were going to go up the stairs to go back up to the next level. Okay. Um, so they start walking down in the downstairs area and they start hearing chanting. They hear weird laughter, and they hear a whole bunch of footsteps and people running around. And they're kind of passing most of this off because the haunted house is going on right now. Oh, okay, okay. Um, that's the only reason why they're there to begin with, because this haunted house is happening. Uh, it's about midnight, maybe 1 o'clock in the morning. And... Um, I can't remember if she said that they saw some kind of a light or something, but they, they approached this particular area because it got their attention for some reason, some way. And uh, at one point in time, they actually had like the Satanistic room set up downstairs as a part of the haunted house. And then they decided that if they couldn't use the elevator, using the basement wasn't a good idea. And they decided to use it for storage. Okay. But when she, she said when they came up into this area, the little fake Satan thing, it like turned its head and looked at them. And she said that for some reason they were both focused on it when it happened. And they both had what we all in my line of work call a nope moment. You turn around, you keep saying nope until you're out of the room, out of the area, out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not here. This isn't happening. I'm not going to let it happen to me. I'm not going to be a statistic. I'm going to be a fact. I'm making it out. Wow. And um, she said they had to come back down after the haunted house was over because they told the owner, and the owner insisted that they cleared the area. He didn't want to call the police to come down there because if the police go in there and they see all the knives and whatnot, they start wigging out and you know it, a lot of it's props some of it's like fake blood and whatnot and it could look like a real scene when it's not gotcha so she had to go back and they went with the owner and a couple of the crew when they went back down there and supposedly right in front of where the satan thing was they found a found a satanistic book that actually had like spells and whatnot in it and the owner burned it 
Whoa. Yeah, they have no idea if they really did come up on something. They didn't find any broken windows. None of the doors were unlocked. They don't know how anybody could have gotten down there unless it was stage crew. Um, but the elevator was officially busted after that, and they had to replace the elevator. Um, the owner had said that the elevator looked like it had literally fallen from the third floor. And they came down from this, what would be considered the second floor, even though it's ground level. Wow. So technically they did fall, but they were riding in the elevator. So I guess they didn't really feel like it fell. Right. And it was a good thing that they had marked it off because it, the sucker wasn't working and it could have hurt somebody. Sure. So the whole thing all put together, they would have been trapped down there if they hadn't known how to get out. Right. And I, I imagine that was pretty... That was her particular story. Wow. Well, here's where my mind goes. Even, you know, even at a level of trying to frighten people and trying to do these frightful things in a haunted house um, in Oklahoma City, um, people will do things unknowingly, open up doors they don't understand. And yep. even if they're, in my mind, based on talking to a friend of mine, Reverend Dave, if they're remotely close to opening these doors up, they will become open. And once you open these doors, the problem is that these unseen realm, will the doors, how do you close the doors? That's the problem. So once you open a door, there's no telling what's coming in, what keeps coming in. And uh, whether it's fake blood or props or whatever, in my mind, these entities don't care. They, they just don't care. Um, and it's just, I see bad things. And you know what's really interesting is that I was reading somewhere where it is very, there's a high rate of very terrifying events, almost um, evil events that have happened at these haunted houses. And I yep. think that what's happening is that people don't have any darn clue what they're doing, but they, oh, let's put a pentagram down. Oh, let's put this down. Oh, let's do this and all that. And what they're doing is they're collecting all these satanic ritualistic type of, of objects that can start opening doors up and they don't understand it. And the problem is when you don't understand something, you shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> and, and so, um, and I've talked to a lot of people here in the last couple of months that, that, that's what's, that's what's happening. And usually it's kids. Um, but that's terrifying. And, yeah. and like I tell people, you don't hear a lot about this stuff in churches because it's not mm -hmm. something people want to hear on a Sunday morning. Oh, I get so upset when I go to particular churches because I do consider myself to be a very religious person. I, because of my line of work, I will wholeheartedly admit I do say things that I shouldn't say from time to time and do things I shouldn't do, but that's also part of being human. I'm sure, sure. Um, but... It, it annoys the living daylights out of me when you walk into a church and they say there's no such thing as ghosts. Or you walk into a church and they say there's no such thing as um, uh, monsters. I'm sorry, but the jails are full of monsters. Okay? A child rapist is a monster. You just don't see the physical form. You see that human being. Mm -hmm. I mean, demons are monsters. Oh, yeah. So yes. you cannot come to me and tell me demons and... Uh, murderers and rapists don't exist, you know? No, I'm with you. And, and I, I'm i more open-minded than I used to be, for sure. This, um, this show has kind of taken on its own um, eye-opening experience for me. Um, but what I've learned is that I believe that there are a lot of people in different faiths that choose not to talk about this because this is something they don't want to talk about. To, it's not a feel-good thing to talk about on Sunday. So I've yeah. often wondered, 
Why not? Because it is very real. This unseen um, spiritual realm is is extremely very real. And yeah. there's aspects of it that's not, that's pretty dark and scary. Um, well, I've had full-blown fights with my mother about it because I don't want her telling my children that monsters aren't real or that ghosts aren't real. And if they see something, I want them to be brave enough to tell me and not think that I'm going to tell them that it doesn't exist. Yeah, and I find it very interesting. I would like to ask those people, if, if they're not real, you know, your opinion's your opinion to each their own. But I would like to know what makes you say that. Why do you feel that way? Or why do you think that way? What is it? Mm -hmm. And if it's, if it's, if it's something, well, that's what we were taught. Um, or that's what I've heard. I get it. A lot of teaching comes from people that you looked up to and you, okay, that's what they said because they said it. But I would like to present factual evidence that we inadvertently caught that was on film. I can tell you it exists a hundred percent. I can tell you things that we recorded inadvertently that I did not hear with my ear, but when I played back, I heard. I have hours of that. Um, and you I have the video I sent you that we have. And my mother thought it was another Chinese weather balloon. Hmm. Uh, yeah, that Chinese weather balloon didn't do that the first time that I'm aware of. Yeah. That I'm aware of. So I think what I gather is that there's so many things that we are just oblivious to that we have not been told over the years to keep us ignorant of the true facts of the real facts of what is truly going on. And unfortunately, you know, it, and I, I get it. I understand why churches won't talk about this because there's a lot of dark, scary aspects to talking about evil, dark entities, shadow figures being pushed into a grave and all those things. Of course, it's scary. But it, it, it makes, the way I look at it, it makes Christianity stand out even more. Yeah, that it does. This is why you want to get right this is why you need to understand who you are in Christ. And so, you know, I know there's so many different faiths out there, but I'm just saying that it, it emphasizes my faith and doesn't de-emphasize it. That's my, what I'm saying. So it just basically says that this unseen realm, these spirits are very real. And um, I got introduced and got a dose of it by accident. But then again, but then again, my brother and I, Bill, were talking about this. Was it by accident or was it ordained that I understand this? We see things that people wouldn't believe, like that story I told you with the cemetery. I can't tell you how many times I've been told you would be an awesome writer because of stories like that. And don't get me wrong, I am a fictional author, but that is not what's going on here this is stuff that's actually happened you know right i wouldn't want to lie about it i wouldn't want to exaggerate it exacerbate it in any way fashion or form no on something like that you know it, people can make up i always say real life is stranger than fiction yep and that it takes a life of its own and it's it's I don't have that much imagination when it comes to that. So that's why real life is scarier and it is more real than what you can make up sometimes. Um, yep. And so and a lot of people don't get why a head turning on a, a, a Satanistic statue would be that scary. Well, for one, it's Satan. So anybody who's Christian is going to look at that and say, nope. And then for two, I wasn't there. I don't know the vibe or the feeling of what was going on in the room. Plus, mm -hmm. you know, the haunted house was going on upstairs, as you said. Right. Um, you just don't know. And so many times these stories, real authentic occurrences, they're not considered that. No. And that's why, you know, when I had Reverend Dave on, um, this is why he said, you know, you got to be right with the Lord. 
no matter where you're at. You know, this is people going to, you know, they're going to have fun. They're going to be scared. And they go into a building not knowing, was there real rituals done here? Was someone seriously doing some stuff? Or was the door opened by accident? This, this, into the sunscreen realm, this portal that's not supposed to be open, you know? So there's a lot of things we don't know. So this is why you need to walk every day. And no matter where you're at, you know, with the armor of God. Just my two mm -hmm. cents. Just my two cents. Um, because you never know. And you don't. You don't. What he does give us the ability, I do believe, is you kind of have your, it's what I call your spiritual radar on. Uh, your spiritual radar, to me, is not being judgmental at all. It's just being aware of your surroundings. Um, and it helps you detect danger. It helps you detect, you know, is this something I want to be involved in or not? whether you're getting a job and you just get a, not a good feeling. I mean, I could go into so many different scenarios here, but I'm just saying that I think that there's a lot more things going on around us. I think there's a battle going on around us and we see it kind of in the news at a global level, mm -hmm. right? At a domestic and international level, we see it going around. And I truly think that that's what it is. It's, it's a battle of good and evil going on around us. And many of which we can't see many of which we can, but, um, and what level that the cryptids are involved in, I think there's a tie in there. I really do. I don't know enough to say what exactly, but I know that there's something very fishy about it. I'll say that. And I, I just get this overwhelming sense that there is an association or tie in to it for sure. I do, I, it's been a long time since I've talked with this one particular friend of mine, but um, when he hears the story, <laughs> he's the one who turned me on to you to begin with. Oh. Um, he uh, was working in the hospital, and he was on his way home one night, and he came up on something that looked like a hybrid of a deer, and it was running on its back two legs when it crossed the road, and he almost hit it with his car. And he said it turned, and it looked at him, and it gave him this, like, evil eye, and then it ran on off into the, the woods like it was running from something. He didn't wait to find out. He went on and he said, I was just that tired. I was going home. Wow. 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 Yeah, that would kind of be uh, eye opening. I've never seen anything like that. That would be kind of frightening early in the morning on yeah. a dark road. About three o'clock in the morning, according to what he said. Yeah, that's that's going to be one of those things that you see and you go, nope, I'm not stopping. Yep. Like I said, we call it the nope factor and people make fun of it online and on TikToks and whatnot. They go on there and they say, you know, nope, 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 nope. When they walk up on something, that is a very real thing. Yes, it's funny. Yes, it's funny when you watch the TikTok. Yes, it's funny when they tell the story. But that's a very real thing. And we, we literally, it has a name. We call it the nope factor. Hmm. Interesting. I've, I've, I've not heard of that, but it makes sense. I mean, I've got some, <laughs> I've got some family members. That's what they say. The first thing is that, nope, 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 not doing it, not doing it. And then, um, my brothers and I were a little bit strange. I don't think we've ever said that. Um, we have in some ways, I know Lane does it, but his nope isn't straying away from it. His nope is okay. I'm hearing something. I'm not taking this. I'm going outside right now to see what this is. And so he'll just go right out of the tent. Light, no light, no gun. He's like, no, nope, we're not doing this. I'm going to see what the heck is going on. So he goes yep. toward it. We all go toward it. Um, yep. Most of the people like me that I know, there's not many that are like me, but I'm a little bit different because I've been born and raised in the country. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm like your brother. We will grab our gun. We'll walk outside. <laughs> Who's there? Yep. Yep. <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. What's going on? I, I'm, I can't take tapping on the window. That's not going to work here. Um, mm -hmm. I'm very much, we're all the same way. We're very reactionary. Um, I, yeah, I, it's. My granddaddy didn't teach me to shoot for no good reason. That's right. That's right. I mean. You just react. That's, that's, you're in the right field. You're in the right field. That's interesting. Wow. I didn't even think about the healthcare field. Hmm. 
Yeah, mm, a lot of gas mm. workers too. I've uh, had several people working at gas stations out in the middle of nowhere that have told me things. One guy told me he actually had a ghost come in and pay for a drink, left the drink on the counter and the food, or not not the food, the drink and the money. Don't even know where the ghost got the money at. But he turned around, or he, he turned to put the money in the register, turned around, and it was gone. They checked the video cameras, and you literally see it disappear on camera. Wow. Wow. And there's so many, I, I've, that's incredible. And there's so many, so many, so many stories like that. I'm sure all over the country. Uh, mm -hmm. That's just, <laughs> and see that right there in itself, you can't tell me with so many people with very vivid sightings and on camera that this doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. It does. It does. It's just, it, it's too scary to believe in the reality of something that exists. So we ignore it. We say it doesn't because we don't have a way. In many ways, I think people don't want to acknowledge something that exists because they really don't, they haven't rationalized it in their head of how to explain it. Right. So I can get that. I, I, I get that. But that, doesn't, if you, it, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Right. And to explain for those who aren't understanding why I'm not telling more of my coworkers' stories and whatnot, it's not my story to tell, like the one I told with the haunted house. It's, it was my friend's story, and I told it as best as I could remember it, but I might not be putting you know, everything in there. Like I said, I don't know how the room felt. I, I don't know if they were having scared feelings when they went down there or not. I just told right. it as I remember it. Yeah, and we appreciate you giving us that second hand. Yeah. I mean, I appreciate that very much. Um, and you're you're right, and I respect that on the rest of the friends. Um, but if anyone else out there, you know, if you hear something like this, I would like to hear. Um, and the reason why we're, we had kind of included some of these ghost stories a little bit more is because, to me, it just emphasizes the reality of the good spiritual realm, the realm that we all want to go to. Right. With mm -hmm. with the Lord. So, um, you know, you can't have good without bad. It's it's like a, it's there's there's good and evil. Mm -hmm. And um, it just it's it's not my it is what it is. So, um, you know, and, and people have real accounts of things. And I always say, you know, I don't prejudge any story because it happened to you. And if it happened to you, it changed just a little bit of who you are as a person. And that's important. And, and that's why I wanted to tell you about this with the, the video that I recorded and the picture that I took, because it's actual proof of what happened, and I didn't have that with the first story I told you. In fact, it was probably a couple of weeks, maybe, after that first thing happened that I told you about, and I was so wigged out when I told you about it. I must have had four or five cigarettes, and I'm not a smoker while I was trying to tell you the story. Hmm. Just to calm my nerves enough to be able to tell you the whole story. And I was really uppity trying to explain it all and put it all out flat for you. Mm. Well, you're this reliving it. Yeah. This, I wasn't feeling in any certain way. I mean, I just happened to see it and I got the picture of it and I knew it wasn't what they were calling it. And they had called that a couple days beforehand. And there's no way that this was a balloon. Yeah. Do I have permission to use that in the show? Absolutely. And and um, it's kind of pixelated. I mean, I have a still photo you sent, and then you could see just a little bit of that blinking in the center of that frame. You might, you might want to uh, take out the, the uh, talking on it. It's up to you. I just don't want our names out there. Oh, no, we can take that. We can take that off. Yeah, we can take that off. Okay. So I'll take it off. They can just make it silent while we're talking the interview. They yeah, can do that. I, I absolutely would not mind if you used it. Um, and again, it, it just falls under so many people think that this is a lie. This is somebody making up a story. It could ruin my career. Oh, well, and that's the other thing that why I really appreciated speaking with you at the first time is that there's so many people like yourself in very important positions that um 
you trust that I'm going to take this out, but you want to talk about it because it's real. It really happened. It happened this way to you. And um, there's so many people in positions that'll never talk. And I, I, I get it. I, I, I do. I understand. But if we don't talk about it, I mean, always, I always say sharing is good medicine. It just, it helps you just relieve, get some relief a little bit more that someone heard that I don't judge you because I've had my own oddities and odd accounts. And um, I know there's so much out there we still don't understand, but it's real. That's, that's the part that's not confusing. And that mm -hmm. um, I remember when my wife said, you know, when you start this show, people are going to find out what you do. And are you concerned about that? And I said, well, yes, but mainly no. No, um, when my patients found out, they thought it was really cool. Um, they just were like, well, are you, you're the same person that's always treated me and you always give me relief. And so, no, it's, so they thought it was a cool aspect, but unfortunately it's not in many other occupations. People can lose their job. And so I really respect that and I'm honored. And as always, we'll keep, of course, all personal information quiet, um, and do that. But, um, that's the thing that I try to emphasize to people. Um, some people, if they get older and they retire, they, I don't care. But people that still rely on a job to feed their family, it's important. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm, I, I will um, continue to honor that confidentiality. Thank you. Yeah, you're, absolutely. Thank you. Um, well, I, 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 it's, it's always an amazing pleasure to talk with you. I was so excited when I heard, because... I remember there's certain stories that I remember and yours was one that I remembered, um, big portions of it. Um, and there's just certain ones that stick out. And, um, so every time I've been in that neck of the woods, if you will, several times. And every time I go by, I think of you, uh, and kind of that retelling. So, um, cause it was so oddly frightening of what you experienced and just, the um, moments and how the retelling and what happened, especially the home incident. So I just thought, wow, that's just something that sticks in my head. But yeah. um, I want to thank you for coming on um, and uh, spending some time with me. And I know I'm not sure if you work tonight or not. So I've probably taken up. Some... Yeah, I'm, I'm at work. Yeah. And I'll, I'll try to send you those pictures of the chicken coops too. So you can kind of see what I'm talking about. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yes, please do that. Please do that. I would love to see it. And if you send that, can I use those pictures as well? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay great, great. Well, thank you again so much for your time. I appreciate you sharing and I uh, look forward to talking with your friend. Now, this is the friend that, tell me what uh, incident they were uh, involved with you. The very first one that I told you about. Oh, okay. He was on the phone with me the entire time. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, yes, yes. And they From heard. The moment I left the house to the moment I got back. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. That would that would be great. So I look forward to that. Um, so thanks again. I appreciate it so much. I know you've been on with me for a little bit, and I I really am honored. So uh, until Wednesday night, we'll talk All again. Right. All right. Look forward to it. We'll talk to you later. Okay. Sounds great. Have a great night. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, guys. Um, this, I, it was so awesome to speak with her. Um, this is a guest that I had some years ago. Um, she had the encounter that she um, would get off from her work at night and take a stroll with her dog. And... Uh, very dark and this was just something she did early early in the morning and uh, she had a habit of doing that it was kind of peaceful you know when you walk at night it's peaceful it's quiet it's got that cool evening but this one particular night that she shared with me a couple years ago um, was terrifying uh, she felt a sense of being followed um, other dogs in the neighborhood were going crazy. Um, she got down to a school that had lights and 
she saw a shadow running. The shadow, um, she could see this figure, she said, that was as big as a, um, like a VW bug. It was huge. And she could see it running along the school wall, and it terrified her. Just how it moved didn't look right. Um, it continued on where she was kind of evading this. She had a friend on the phone. That's who we're going to talk to. And the friend, she called a friend just to be on the phone. And the friend, I think I'm trying to recall back in my memory, the friend could hear all these dogs barking in the neighborhood. And it's like, what's going on? And then eventually she went home. And then I don't think it was that night, but it was another night where, she, as she said, she came home and the garage door went um, up. And she's like, what's going on? So anyway, um, that story, I can't remember what number it is on some of the encounters, but that was a good one to listen to. Um, that was incredible. So anyway, that's this guest we just spoke to. I look forward in talking to her friend that was with her the whole time on the phone that night. Um, in the meantime, guys, I appreciate you listening for this time. I hope you took note and made some uh, special notes here and there. Um, until next time, guys, be safe, take care, and always watch your six. And if you have an encounter of any kind, whether it be paranormal, you have you made a sighting of a creature, or any type of a possible UFO craft of any nature, give me a call at 866-306-8085. Again, that's 866-306-8085. Eight zero eight five. Until next time, this is Lance with Monster 911. See you soon.